I wanted to use my time today as part of this group to tell you a little bit about the Tinder story. Um, first of all, actually, uh, how many people here have heard of Tinder? Cool. That works out. That saves me the explanation of what Tinder is and how it works. So I can skip over that. Anyway, Tinder's mission is one that everybody who works there feels really passionate about. And that is that we want to create real world connections that wouldn't otherwise be possible. So just to get us started, let's uh, review a few facts about Tinder. More than a million dates occur because of Tinder every week. That's uh, people meeting in the real world. And we've had over 10 billion matches. And to make that happen, there's over 1.4 billion swipes that contribute to, uh, to 26 million matches every single day. And just this January 3rd of this year, we surpassed 100 million downloads. And it was actually our busiest day on, uh, in our history. And so these numbers themselves are pretty impressive. I'm, at least they are to me. And uh, so, but really, Tinder is increasing the number of connections in the world. And we're bringing people together uh, at a scale that no other platform has really been able to do before. And so, in essence, we're changing the world, and that's a really beautiful thing. So, I know that a lot of us were building and designing apps, and we're probably at different stages in that process. Um, so, as a result, I thought today, since it's all about design and data and marketing, I would share the story of Tinder and, and look at, through the lens of like, where we came up with some of our iconic features uh, in the design of the app and our users and how the application has evolved uh, with them while staying focused on our original goal. And the way that we marketed it from the beginning when nobody knew about Tinder and we, what we were really trying to achieve there. So, as I was preparing this talk, I realized that I could see every stage of my life and Tinder's story uh, as a series of matches. Uh, we built the app to help people meet each other and to create real connections. And it basically helps change the direction of people's lives. And so, I want to look at your, uh, I, want, I want us all to look at our journeys uh, the same way. And between us today, let's see if we can make a few new matches to help us along the way. So, now that I've introduced Tinder and the context of what we're going to talk about today, I thought I should introduce myself uh, to those I haven't had a chance to yet. So, hey, I'm, uh, I'm Jonathan Bedeen. I'm the uh, Chief Strategy Officer at Tinder, and, uh, which is actually a reasonably new title for me. And I get to do a few important things, I think. Uh, it allows me to figure out where we're going as a company, um, all around the company, and uh, from a strategic point of view, hence the strategic, uh, strategy part. Um, and as we're growing and bringing in new people into the company, it allows me to make sure that we have a group of people who are really guiding the product and uh, abiding by those original sort of the mission of ours. And I also love finding the things that are going to make the platform better. The, uh, the going through the hundreds of ideas that we have each week and, and sorting through and figuring out which one's really going to be the best for the platform. And it's a goal of mine to merge both the creativity and data into something that will help people. That's what we're basically all about. So anyway, speaking of created things, uh, we recently launched the ability to send GIFs in messages this January. And this GIF of Jimmy Fallon is the most popular on Tinder. I think you can probably see why. I sent it a couple times, I think. So a few stats about those GIFs, though, that I think you'll find interesting. So, Conversations that include a GIF actually last twice as long as those without. And GIFs are, uh, when you send a GIF, it's actually 30% more likely to receive a response than a normal message. And due to all of that, 20 million GIFs have been sent since its launch on January 27th. But, 
before we get ahead of ourselves, I kind of want to rewind, which is another feature in Tinder, um, and take you back about 10 years uh, ago, before, I, before Tinder was even a concept. At the end of the world. Dear God, we thank you for the gifts you give us each day. We thank you for protecting us from the undead. A battle still remains between man. Can you talk? And zombie. I'm gonna give you about five seconds to convince me not to kill you. They catch you running, and then we'll just take it back and eat your ass. Stay as close to me as you can. <laughs> We've got a straggler. One o'clock, about 200 yards. You know what's at stake. We put the militia on high alert. We gotta take every step necessary to ensure our safety. One of our guys was captured by them. It's got something to do with that zombie farm. What do you think his chances of survival? He's smart, keeps his mouth shut. He'll be okay for a little while. They'll just eat him, sir. Enslaved like animals. Bread for food. To fight. So yeah, it's me embedding an axe into some zombie's head. Um, that script for Zombie Wars was actually so bad that depending on which page you're reading, uh, I had a different, my character had a different name. Um, it was a lot of fun though, actually. So, you know, if you ever have the chance to star in a zombie movie, I highly recommend you do it. But, why, am I, why on earth am I actually showing this to you? So, while I was preparing this talk, I realized that without zombies, I wouldn't be here today. That zombies were a significant match for me in my life. And it sort of started a series of matches that really brought me to where I am. And so the point is, I didn't actually set out to make Tinder. I didn't wake up one morning and think, oh, you know, there's going to be an app that's going to be uh, help people meet each other, it's going to be really simple and have this really catchy gesture. didn't happen that way. And many of us here, you know, we're probably, try we're probably going to be doing something completely different when we actually figure out that thing that, that catches on with people. So, for me, back in 2005, I was preparing for law school, uh, and I was in New York, and I was at a bar where I kind of had my quarter-life crisis. And I decided to throw caution at the wind, screw law school, and I decided I want to become an actor. I'm going to pursue that. So I did, became an actor, went out to LA. And this sort of started me on my, my next match that really made a huge difference in my life. So as many of you might recognize this, it is not for steering a ship, but it's the settings gear within Tinder. And sometimes you'll visit it for very specific reasons. And a lot of the times it might be because you've run out of people to swipe on. And when that happens, you need to kind of expand your horizons a little bit. You might be adjusting your age range that you're looking for, or your search radius. And uh, maybe you'll, and, and that's gonna help you uh, find more people. It's sort of a normal part of Tinder. Everybody probably who's used it knows about. Now, I actually kind of think of this as part of, uh, part of my life where I was going from job to type to job type to uh, growing my skills and expanding my goals and uh, I think of this as the discovery settings in Tinder. And in the app you can change all sorts of variables and you can do the same thing in life. It's, uh, you just really have to keep tweaking your skills until you find that perfect match for you. And so this is actually my first lesson of the day. I want you to know right now that it's okay to give up on things. It's fine to change your goals, and it's okay to go and change your settings. So, zombies, they were a significant part of a, a significant thing in my life, but it was really only because it got me to LA. And it was while I was in LA that I got a job as a designer at a casting software company. And now being in tech, I actually had the opportunity to do a little bit of programming. And it turns out I actually liked it a lot. And so I started to teach myself a little bit of that every day. And then I think it was 2009, the, uh, one of the favorite things in my life, the 
iPhone comes out, and I just, I wanted to work on that. And so I started to teach myself that too. I loved the, the flexibility and how it had sort of captured people's imaginations, and it really represented new challenges in personal computing. It was also uh, really inspiring. It was this device that was more personal than anything else that really had come before it. And it was something where you could really almost literally touch the software um, of the, uh, on the device. And I've always been really intrigued by trying to create ways to help people. And if I can do that in a way that makes them uh, have fun while doing what might normally be considered work, the better. And the iPhone really did that. It, uh, it made really enjoyable experiences, so it was something I really wanted to be a part of. So. I'd like you to raise your hand if you are a designer, or you design. Okay, okay. And then how about if you program? Okie dokie. And then what about people in marketing? Anybody involved in that? A eh? little bit of each. I, oh, I think I saw somebody over there and they might have had three hands up there. But, uh, so, it's actually fine if you are none of these, all of these, one of these. Uh, you just have to keep experimenting, following, uh, uh, and, and change your settings and figure out your interest until you really settle on the right thing and find that match. And if it you know, makes you feel any better, it's important to remember that the mobile app revolution is really one made up of startups. You know, and that's small teams that usually people who ha are wearing multiple hats and they're really just trying to work together and help each other out. So I'm sure this is all something that we can relate to. And I just want you to remember that it's okay to change your skill set, your job, your interests, um, company really at any point. So changing your settings, it's going to widen your horizons, and it's going to allow you to make uh, more connections, which are going to help you discover that perfect match for you. So those of us that use Tinder probably going to recognize this. The, the like stamp is that thing. I don't know why I'm explaining. Everybody knows what Tinder is already. So it's something that you're going to, uh, as a Tinder user, also hope that is applied to your own profile quite a bit. Actually, it's probably of no surprise that most of the time when people figure out what I do for a living, they're always asking me how to essentially get that more. But I don't have that. I'm not going to be imparting those tips today. Anyway, um, I want to let you know, uh, I wanted to tell you a little bit about the next match in my life which helped me get to this, uh, where really where the swipe came from. And something that quickly became kind of an iconic part of Tinder and part of our, somehow our daily vocabulary. So you remember that I was in LA and I was working at that software company. And at that time I had met uh, a gentleman named Sean Rad, uh, who was recruiting people for a team at a company called uh, Hatch Labs. And Hatch Labs was this incubator that was focused on mobile uh, apps and all. And we started building things. I was really, uh, we really saw eye to eye. We started building this thing called Cardify. It was a loyalty rewards program thing that hooked up to your credit card. And at the same time, we started building this application that allowed you to meet people. And that would eventually be named Tinder. So it might surprise you, it does a lot of people, that the swipe was actually not part of the first version of the application, something I added a few weeks later into a uh, second release. But it was such a natural gesture, and it solved some real problems on mobile, which, you know, is, as we all know, it can be a little bit tricky uh, to, uh, to get right. So, I think the best thing about the swipe is that it can be done walking down the street using a single hand, um, and it really was perfect for Tinder. You know, we have, and it, it shows, with 1.4 billion swipes a day, there's a lot of them. But we didn't really start there. I mean, it's a, a natural gesture, but how do we get from that first swipe to that many? So in Tinder's case, we decided that we should seed the application to a, certain, uh, to a group of individuals. And 
we chose college students, which might actually seem like a little bit of a strange choice, considering college students are not really known for needing to have an app to meet more people, or it's something that's almost part of their daily lives or fine dates. But there were some characteristics about the college crowd that, uh, that were really appealing. So first uh, was the density of the population on college campuses. There's uh, so many people there that it really ensured that you have a small search radius, you're going to be able to see people. And that was really important for Tinder. And second, the college crowd is, is transient. You know, they go home for vacation and, and the summer, and they share things and what, you know, the new things with their friends, and they take it back all over the place. And third, and probably most important, though, is that students seem to be trendsetters. And they're really keen to try out new things. And our app being something that nobody had really done quite like we had before, uh, made sense there. And so it was really interesting. It was a great, fascinating learning experience for the Tinder team when we, uh, uh, seeing how people interacted with and, and adopted the application. And what we knew is, is that if we could get college students, people who don't even normally need something like this to, uh, to like it, that everybody in the world is going to probably like it afterwards. And that was the moment that Tinder had matched with its first audience. And it kind of snowballed from then on. But as it, as it grew, we weren't exactly compelled to keep adding new features. Um, we, we uh, or features and functions. And in fact, it, since it started to become big in 2013, it really hasn't changed that much from year to year. The, so, which actually brings me to the second lesson that I want to leave you with. Don't iterate too much. Don't add features for the sake of it. Stick to your original goal and uh, trust that if it solves a problem, that people are going to like it. Uh, and you should use data as much as you can and iterate on your idea, but you should really try to keep focused on that original goal. I can't even begin to tell you how many different things uh, that we've come up with that didn't make it into the application. Only the ideas that really furthered our core mission make it into the app. And there's really only been a handful of those in the entire history. So actually, let me give you an example of that, which, as you can see, uh, the super like in use, which really allows you to express your interest in somebody on Tinder. So we launched this in October of last year, uh, globally. And it was really the most significant feature that we've released within the application since the swipe. But we tested the feature out in Australia first, and we found some really interesting things, uh, uh, interesting data about how people, it changed the way that people use Tinder. So we found that users are three times more likely to find their perfect match when using a super like over a normal like. And we also found that the conversations between people involving a super like lasted 70% longer. So the super like, an idea that made it through to testing uh, above hundreds of other ideas, was showing that people were enjoying more matches while also enjoying deeper connections with those matches. And that was exactly Tinder's core goal. So we rolled out the feature globally, and as soon as we could, and it became one of those rare additions to the application because it truly progressed uh, our mission. The data we had collected uh, really helped us, uh, showed us the way uh, uh, where we should go with this. Sometimes, no matter how much of the data that you have, you really need to just open up your eyes to the world around you and, and observe. To illustrate this sort of organic nature uh, that sort of fueled Tinder's explosion of uh, growth, I wanted to tell you about how we hired our VP of design, Andrew Rudman. So way back before Andrew worked at Tinder, he was living in New York, and he was using Tinder, and he matched up with a girl who was visiting from Los Angeles. They actually didn't meet, but uh, over the next couple months, they talked on Tinder, really got to know each other, really made a connection. And it was actually here, uh, here in San Francisco 
not too far from here, I believe, that they met for the very first time. And they, Andrew had found the love of his life. So not too much longer, he moves to Los Angeles to live with her. Now, having moved to Tinder's hometown, Los Angeles, he started to build his network, and he followed me on Tinder. And I noticed that he'd had, and I had recognized, I was already aware of some of his work, so I, of course, sent him a message and said, hey. And he ended up coming in for an interview, and it was really within a matter of days that he was now part of the Tinder team. And that's exactly the kind of organic connection that happens all the time on Tinder. Uh, might not, it, that it wouldn't happen without this technology. There's no way that he would have found her, found the love of his life, moved all the way across the country, get a job. Um, but that's the kind of thing that Tinder does. And you have to look for those things. You'd, sometimes your app might not, might surprise you in the way that it's used and might offer uh, all sorts of things that you didn't think might have been possible. And for us, it was actually pretty great because we got an incredible VP of design out of it. And it's this very fact, though, that we're, we at Tinder, and all of us really, we're involved in human relationships. And that means that uh, we have to keep our eye on the real world. And so we can't be just about the hard data. We're involved with uh, human interactions, and that is more organic and it's more exciting than just looking at numbers on a spreadsheet. So, speaking of some of the incredibly talented people at Tinder, it's for this reason that we have a full-time sociologist at Tinder who's named Dr. Jessica Carbino, and Jess, as we call her, uh, she looks at human connection in a way that uh, goes beyond binary data. She sees Tinder as helping uh, humans at a fundamental level. And so she says, and I'll quote, human connection is a fundamental need when we consider a hierarchy of needs, people generally go from shelter, clothing, food, all the basic needs to stay alive. And as we advance the hierarchy of needs, people begin to crave human interaction. We are embedded naturally into communities every day, and given that, people also crave more meaningful connections that they are not necessarily placed, or naturally placed into. And so that's really why Tinder is so powerful. You know, we'd solved a problem for people and made it easy and simple to use. And suddenly, there's new connections being made all around us. And we applied a technological solution to solve an age-old problem that's always existed. So we do know a lot about our audience. We know that 85% of our users are between the ages of 18 and 34. We know that the most right-swiped men are pilots, the most right-swiped women are physical therapists. Um, but that said, you cannot always be 100% about data. It's sometimes we need to solve the problems that are staring us straight in the face every day. And so our story about the VP of design really illustrates this. We didn't set out to create an app to find us a, an amazing designer, but it did in your app might surprise you too. So this is the third lesson that I'd really like to leave you with today. Keep things rooted in the real world. Test things out on your friends, and no matter how much data you have, always be open to what's going on around you. And observe the way that people uh, interact in life and the real world. And watch for those softer signals, and you'll probably find some really interesting findings that go way beyond anything you're going to see in a spreadsheet. So solve the problems that are happening right in front of you. I think actually emojis are a really good example of this. I'm going to try not to spill that water. So do you think that if we had looked at all of the hard data, we'd see that we should probably create a little image with a girl flicking her hair. I don't think that would happen. I also don't think we would have discovered that the eggplant would be the most popular uh, uh, icon or whatever to send to, in a message. 
But Tinder was a solution to dating. It was something that you could get, help you get that phone number. It's, the, uh, it's that way for picking up the courage to interact with that person, for having to force small talk on someone, uh, for covering up those awkward pauses, and for wondering like, if that person was your perfect match or not. But thanks to all the connections, uh, it quickly became something even bigger than all of that. And we're as committed to this goal as, as much as we were from day one. So you never know where it's going to take you in your product, in your life. Uh, each connection opens up so many more opportunities and, and the matches are really the most important thing in your life. So you need to really make the most of them. Anyway, I wanted to say thank you for listening to me, another one of the popular gifs. Um, and I want to leave you with a couple thoughts that might hopefully help you in your own journey. So first off, I want to remember that design has a real function. Uh, don't plan to create an iconic gesture. It just doesn't work that way. And try to just basically create something that's usable, intuitive, and stick to your guns if people try to get you to overcomplicate your app by adding too many things to it. Keep it simple. And try to solve real problems. The absolute best marketing is going to, not going to be on how much you can spend and, uh, and all, but it's really going to be trying to solve a real solution, uh, create a real solution for a real world problem. If you do that, that's, people are going to uh, love it and, and flock to it. So third, stay focused on your audience. You know, use the data that you're collecting, but never forget about the real world. And pay attention to them and, and, uh, and see the way that people interact with your product in the real world and interact with each other. And the best data comes from your audience. And lastly, most important of all, you know, make sure that you see your life as a series of matches and the evolution of your product as a series of matches too. And some of them are going to be serendipitous. Some of them are going to require a little bit that might have come along with a little bit of help. Sometimes it might be because of Tinder. Um, but lastly, or with life and, and your product, you need to make the most of those matches. You know, try new things, encourage people to make matches in your own apps, and listen to the feedback from the matches that are happening around you all the time. And do your best to make the best of, what, uh, of each one and see the positive in each one. Because sometimes those matches, they're not going to work out. And in fact, sometimes they're going to end up with, in a breakup. But that's fine too, because every match is a learning experience. And it, just another step in that journey. You never know where it's going to take you. But actually, speaking of breakups, uh, raise your hand if you remember the film The Breakup with Vince Vaughn, Jennifer Aniston. Indeed, indeed. Well, I think you're going to like this. So, watch for the guy in the skull cap at the end <laughs> here. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Just saying we shouldn't wait so long next time before we... Yeah. Catch up. We have a lot more to talk about. Yeah. So. Good. Okay. Bye. Yeah, so acting didn't exactly work out for me, but uh, I'm kind of okay with that. Um, so, thank you for listening. I hope you have a wonderful day. Some great things coming ahead.